Oh my god. And now I don't have enough money for rent. Oh my god! Do you have enough? No, but I'm getting my check today, so I will. We have to find another roommate. To sleep in my bed. We have to find you a new partner. Okay, how am I supposed to find somebody to fall in love with me and move in in less than 24 hours? I made you a profile. You already have three dates tonight. Better look hot. What about yours? Oh, mine died. Why would you say that? Don't mention her next time. You can't start a relationship with a lie. This isn't about love. This is about rent, babe. Bringing a different type of blend Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9 For the older folks, so even if you younger No matter what sport, this show, we got it covered It's filmed live in the middle of BK So ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays Real, real fans, show. real talk, we as real as you thought Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought What's going on? It's Trip Young. Welcome back to another Quarantine TV edition of Real Fans Real Talk. I got my bro with me, Legend in Two Games. I know you have been having a, a tough uh, couple of days, but uh, I'm glad you got back with me for, for we get this uh, show in. Yeah, yeah. Part of my appearance, I know normally I come in with the do rag or make sure my hair is ready, but it's been a hectic few days. Um, but it's all good. You know, we're gonna keep it moving. But before we do, I gotta send a be uh, special birthday shout out to my oldest daughter Leilani who I love very much uh she's visited the studio with me several times so I wanted to start off the day by wishing her a happy birthday she's with me today obviously but I want it on air as well oh de definitely happy birthday um I know if she was if she was standing next to you right now she would get at me because the Rockets beat the Lakers and uh in game one and she knows how I feel about LeBron and I know how she feels about James Harden but a happy happy birthday and we, we might as well just get right into this Lakers right. Rockets <laughs> series with that with that being said uh you know it was it was it was a tough one but again you know I didn't I didn't pick the Lakers to sweep this series um, but, you know, this was the fill out. You know, I think LeBron goes into every series. LeBron is like, uh, is tactical like Mayweather. When Mayweather checks out, you know, the first four rounds, he's observing the fighter, seeing what you're going to do. LeBron uses game one to see what you're going to do. Um, he, you know, he said, he said, we realized, uh, we figured out the speed, I guess, how fast uh, the Rockets were in game one. So I think they'll be ready at this, uh, this evening to come back and take game two. And ultimately, I think they 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 knock off the Rockets. Um, I I said I said six for five. If James Harden plays like he did in in, in game uh, in game seven against OKC, so I'm still sticking with with the with the Lakers in six. But you know I I do I do think they, they the Lakers bounce back tonight. They know what they got to do in order to beat Houston, and I think they bounce back tonight, and it'll be one one um, by the end of the weekend. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um... And in regards to, like you said, you, you and Leilani have had this ongoing beef back and forth uh, because she's been a James Harden fan for quite some time. So uh, she was watching a game the other night with a little bit of a smirk on her face as well. But, um, yeah, I, I'm not surprised that Houston took game one. We talked about it the other day in our, in our preview of the second round. And I said that Lakers being on for a week, you get a little rusty. You have to adjust to the game speed, as you mentioned. And it showed that night they had a you know a really bad second half of that game and they 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 were trying to figure it out. I think they'll make the adjustments. I said all along I had Lakers in six games. And to remind people all the time, you know, people assume that game one is the end all be all. Game one is just the start of the fight, as you mentioned. That's the first few rounds of a fight. Game two to me is where the series really starts because that's where you start to see the adjustments. So I expect LeBron and AD to make some adjustments tonight. 
I expect them to figure out ways to take away the efficiency that Houston played with the other night. Even though Houston didn't shoot a high as high of a three-point percentage as I thought they would, again, as you mentioned, I think their speed caught the Lakers a little bit off guard, and the Lakers' rustiness happened. So I, don't, I wasn't surprised by anything we saw in game one. I, I would be more surprised if the Lakers came out flat tonight. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. That was, I'll be surprised. Even with, with Rondo coming back, you could tell he was shaking off the rust. But I actually liked Rondo being out there on the floor for the Lakers. You know, he's still working back into his groove. But he, he had a couple of couple of big shots that I, that I like. And I'm like, all right, Rondo's back. And we saw the difference when the Lakers actually had someone else that could actually facilitate the offense with Rondo being back out there because he's literally the only other, you know, uh, floor general that they have. So when LeBron goes to the bench, I'm actually okay now knowing that Rondo is out there and he can kind of set the tone for the offense and he can play defense as well. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to, to game two. Again, I think the Lakers have a bounce back performance. Don't, 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 don't lose faith yet. If you've you been rocking with the Lakers, don't lose your faith just like uh, they lost game one against uh, Portland, and we saw what happened right after that. Even though Houston, I believe, is a better team than Portland is, but I still think the outcome doesn't change. The Lakers win this series, and they move on to the next round. But, uh, you know, we got, we, got a, we got some time. We got some time before that game pops up. Before that game, though, there might be a sweep going on uh, today. Now, we we both spoken about – that Miami Heat team and their ability to beat up on the Milwaukee Bucks. And right now, Jimmy Butler has those guys up three games to none. And Giannis tweaked his ankle, and he's actually questionable uh, for game four. Now, personally, I, either way, I think whether Giannis plays or not, this series is over. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, be a sweep. I just think that Miami has their number. I have not seen any team dominate the Milwaukee Bucks the way the Miami Heat have. Now, that's not to say they'll do that against anybody else in the in, in the, the, the playoffs who's left, but they have the Bucks number. And whether or not Giannis has a game like he had in game one or if he's putting up his, his season averages, 29, 13, whatever, they still have the Bucks number, and I think they close this thing out in four. I think the series is definitely over, whether it ends tonight, whether it ends a few nights from tonight. It's, it's over. Miami has, has taken their heart, um, and Miami has basically bullied them around a the basketball court. And game three was, was no different in regards to the ending, the same way we saw game one and, for that matter, game two. All three of those games, Milwaukee was in position to possibly win. And the moment was too big for them. And on the flip side of that, Jimmy Butler has embraced the moment. In game three alone, he outscored the Bucs in the fourth quarter. He has taken on the challenge to show everyone that not only are we the better team, I'm the best player in this series. So all the accolades, you can give that to be honest, you can continue to praise him. I'm still the better player. I can get any shot I want whenever I want. There is nobody on your defense that can defend me. Giannis at this point has continued to be scared to take on the challenge of guarding Jimmy Butler. You know what I'm saying? He, he, he questioned the other day when a reporter said, why didn't you take the assignment? He said, well, the coach didn't give it to me. Why would you ask me that question? Well, we're asking you because you're the defensive player of the year. And we, like, am I lying? Like, no, you're, right. <laughs> you're the defensive player of the year and your team is fighting for their lives. And yet you don't want to take on the challenge of guarding the best player on the opposite team. So, of course, we're going to wonder, do you have the heart? And, and recently, when I was sitting down with a good friend of the show, uh, our boy Andrew Salah from Combos Court, I told him after game one, I thought Milwaukee was shell-shocked. He laughed when I said it. He said, I don't understand how a team could be shell-shocked in the bubble. But guess what? How do you continue to come up soft in big moments unless you're scared of the moment? They are shell-shocked. They are facing a team that has continued to punch them in the face, and they don't want to fight back. And like Mike Tyson always said, everybody's got a game plan to get punched in the face. Well, Milwaukee got punched in the face in game one, game two, and game three. They still have yet to respond. The series is over. Miami's moving on. Milwaukee, again, is going to have a disappointing finish to their season. Yeah, I mean, listen, you, you, you said it all right there. Uh, this, First of all, if we lose 
if we're the number one seed and we lose game one and Jimmy Butler put up 40 points on us, I don't give a damn what the coach says. Game two, I'm locking them up, especially if I'm the defensive player. Yeah, I mean, I kind of thought Anthony Davis was the defensive player of the year, but even if you, if you if you had Giannis as defensive player of the year, it still wouldn't would have been one and two. So you still should be able to lock up Jimmy Butler, especially at six eleven, and you're an athletic freak of nature. You should be able to at least somewhat contain Jimmy Butler, but he's doing anything that he wants pretty much. The rest of the guys are shooting the lights out. Nobody is stopping nobody. My main man, Swaggy T, is out there, you know, looking, looking, looking good from the three-point line, pretty much from everywhere on the court, handling the ball, facilitating the offense. Uh, Goran Dragic, been amazing the entire series. Uh, Duncan Robinson, bam out of bio. I, I mean, he caught the little the, the banger on, uh, on, on, on Giannis. The Miami Heat are having their way with the Milwaukee Bucks in a way that even we didn't even picture that they would be abusing the Milwaukee Bucks. You know, I, I knew there was a chance that they could win this series, but I still kind of gave the edge to Milwaukee. But they have manhandled the Milwaukee Bucks, and I, I agree. They, I, they, they look, they, they look shell shocked. They don't know what to do. Um, I can't even, you know, the, your, your second and your third best player, Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez have been playing really well. They've been playing up to par with, with, with what they've been doing all season, and it's still not enough. Giannis has to take on the charge. Now, nobody has come back from being down 3-0 and won a series, so that's out the window. But at least come out of this thing with some self-respect and some dignity. Do not get swept out of the first round and you're the defensive player, excuse me, out of the second round, and you're the defensive player of the year, and more than likely they're going to give you the MVP award again, and you get swept out of the second round of the playoffs. We're talking about during the, the whole season the determining factor in whether or not Giannis stayed in Milwaukee is them making it to the finals. These guys aren't even going to make it to the conference finals. So uh, Milwaukee, you better – Hold on, and, and you know how the, how the kids grab on the grandpa's uh, ankles and grandpa got to be walking and try to drag the kids behind them? Y'all better hold on to Giannis' legs like that because that, that young brother, is he's up out of here because y'all can't even get out of a second-round series versus the Miami Heat, and they're a relatively young team. With the exception of, of, of Jimmy Butler and Dragic, Duncan Robinson, Tyler Harrow, Bam Adebayo, Kendrick Nunn, you know, I mean, and I guess you got Iguodala, but we're not, even, we're not even talking about, you know, finals MVP Iguodala. We're talking about older, way past his prime Iguodala, who's playing, what, maybe 10, 10 to 12 minutes a game? And the rest of those guys are young. Y'all couldn't do nothing with them the whole series. I'm sorry, Bucks fans, but it, it, the party's over. Yeah, get get the get the brooms out. Um, and most importantly, start booking your vacation if you're the Milwaukee Bucks because your season is over. Uh, so you can, uh, in, in, the, in the great words of Nick Van Exel, who one time broke a huddle with the Lakers, one, two, three, Cancun, uh, it's over. Mm-hmm. But I think we, we've been critical in the past of James Harden and his uh, no shows in the playoffs. We need to start holding Giannis to that same standard because Giannis, again, is going to be the third straight year of a disappointing series and a disappointing exit. I also am not a fan of, the fact that Giannis has yet to take on the challenge that I'm the best player on the court. You know, you're down 0-2, right? We, no matter how you felt about the ending of game two, you're down 0-2 going into game three. Giannis should have had the mindset of, I'm not coming off the court no matter what. If I got to play 42, 45 minutes tonight, that's what I'm doing because we cannot afford to go down 3-0. What does he do? He plays 36 minutes. Yeah. 36 minutes. Right. Why are we managing your minutes as if you're some old veteran? You are the star player. Right. You come out, you play 36 minutes, you score 21 points. Your season is on the line and you're telling me 21 points in 36 minutes and you're okay with that. No, you you should have been barking at your coach. Don't take me off this floor until we have secured this win. If you want to steal a minute or two for me to rest here or there towards the end of a quarter or ter- certain timeout strategies that you're going to use to get me some rest, fine. But you're not taking me off the court. And we, we talked about this the other day 
in regards to Game 7 with Denver and Utah. Those teams were battling for their lives. Donovan Mitchell did not sit the whole second half of the game, neither did Jamal Murray. Last mm-hmm. night, Toronto's down 2-1. Their season is on the line because they know if they go down 3-1 to Boston, it's pre- pretty much over. For the second half of that game, Van Fleet, Lowry, and si- Siakam played every minute of the second half of that game for them to be able to win that game and at least even the series up and now give yourself a chance to, to come back and win the series. But Giannis in, in Milwaukee is playing it too cool. They're, I don't understand. I, I'm not sticking with my normal sh- uh, substitution patterns when my season's on the line. My season's on the line. I need my star play out there, point blank, period. But it, it doesn't matter because you're going to get all the rest you want because your season's over. Yeah, Budenhauser, he's, he's gone. He's Absolutely. Out. There's no way LeBron is 36 and, and is willing to go 40, 45 minutes – 48 minutes then <laughs> if he got to he's willing to take on that on that charge there's no way you should be averaging 36 minutes in a playoff series that you're losing now if you was blowing miami out every game and you was only playing 36 minutes that's one thing but you are losing these games and it's not it's not even close like miami pretty much controlled every game but barring maybe like a couple of minutes here and there the Miami Heat controlled every aspect of this game. There's no reason why Giannis is not on the floor for at least 42 minutes every game. Especially once you go down 0-2, that's, that's out the window. Like you said, uh, Eric, game two, that's the key game where we see what's going to happen in this series. You go down 0-2, you throw, you throw that whole game plan out the window. Now, I know there's not home, home court advantage. But you throw that whole game plan out of the window and everything got to change. We're going with, with seven guys, and those seven guys, they're going to lock in. They're going to get their minutes. Chris Middleton is not coming up the floor. Brooke Lopez, he may come up the floor because he's a little bit older, but for the most part, we're trying to keep him on the floor. Eric Bledsoe is staying on the floor. Like, these guys need to be on the floor the entire game if that's what it takes. Now we're at a point where it don't matter. You might as well play him at 36 minutes tonight. Because this thing is over with. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Like I said, Budenholzer, you should have played him. I don't know what you was trying to preserve him for because you you ain't going to be there next year. So, it won't even matter whether Giannis is there or not because you are going to be coaching someplace else if you even get a, a coaching job next season. You might have to take the year off because you got the arguably one of the best players in basketball who did something that only or is possibly going to do something that only Michael Jordan – and Hakeem Olajuwon have done, which is win the MVP and Defensive Player of the Year award in the same season, and you guys have the number one record in the Eastern Conference, and you not only do you do you lose the second round, but you about to get swept out of the second round of the playoffs. You ain't gonna be there next year, bro. So you should have been expending all of the minutes to make sure that you had a job with the Milwaukee Bucks next season. I'm sorry, man, but but y'all up out of there. The uh, but the but the. the the second uh, series in, in, the, in the Eastern Conference playoffs, you got you mentioned it a little bit with uh with, with Toronto and the Boston Celtics tied up. I think I think I think this series is gonna go go the distance. I was a little shaky at first with uh with Toronto after they went down 0-2. I know they did get saved in Game Three. Uh, OG Anubi he hit that three at the end of the game that, that which saved the series for them. But they came out in Game Four looking like NBA champions, playing like NBA champions, and had that, that mentality like, hold up, no, 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 we're supposed to be here. We just come off of winning the championship. I don't care if Kawhi Leonard is here or not. We still have a championship mentality. These guys know how to win. Uh, you know, not only has Van Fleet and Kyle Lowry and Ibaka and, and Gasol been there, you know what I'm saying, been there last year and won it. A lot of those, they, those guys have a lot of, of playoff experience. Ibaka went to the finals before with, with, with OK, OKC before before that. So these guys know what it takes to win. I love the fact that they fought back and now everything is tied up 2-2. I want to see how one of my top coaches in the league, uh, Brad Stevens, now comes back and responds because, you know, you can come back, you know, game three, you know, you, you take that with a grain of salt. You lost it at, at, at the buzzer. It happens. But game four, uh, Toronto showed you, you know, why they were NBA champions. So now you got to come back around with a different game plan. Shout out to Kemba, you know, because he kind of took onus on that one. 
he said he has to be more aggressive. That he only took what fourteen shots in the in, in the game, something like that. So he said he's coming back more aggressive. So I I, I want to see what adjustments they make now because we're starting to see Siakam play like he you know come back to to what he what he has been doing all season, what he did last year. He's kind he's finally getting into his groove against this team. You don't want to let Siakam heat up and do and really do what he was doing in the finals last year and ball out like that. If you got a chance to to shut this thing down early, I you know I I, I know that Boston regrets that they let uh, Toronto come back in Game Three and, and, and get that get that buzzer beater to win the game because you go up 3-0 in the, in 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 the series at that point, that's it. You know what I'm saying? Like you you could pretty much mail this thing home. But now the Toronto Raptors have the momentum going into Game Five. Yeah, uh, Boston definitely blew a golden opportunity to have a stranglehold on a series and be ready to put it away. But I, I do think 2-2 two, two is where they should be in, in regards to the series because in game two, Marcus Smart had to turn into damn near Steph Curry to kind of save Boston. You know, Boston was down 12 points and then Marcus Smart goes off for five three-pointers in the fourth quarter and it becomes a brand new game and Boston wins that game. Um, and in game three, OG shot. Obviously, save Toronto. But game one, Boston looked like the clear-cut better team. Game four last night, I thought Toronto looked like the better team. And as you mentioned, now it is on Brad Stevens and Nick Nurse. What coach can make the proper adjustment? Nick Nurse coached desperate yesterday, and I loved it. Again, his three best players did not come off the floor in the second half. It was a close game. They ended up winning by nine points. Every time Boston tried to make a surge, like you said, Si Siakam made big shots down the stretch. Cal Lowry made some big shots. Kyle Lowry also is very tough defensively. He's making Kemba work for everything that he gets. So I like what I'm seeing from both these teams. This right now is looking like the probably the best series so far of the second round. And I'm expecting to see who's going to make the proper adjustments. I still, still like Boston. I still like him. I said from the jump this was going to be a seven-game series, so I'm not shocked that we're 2-2. But now it is on Brad Stevens to be able to outcoach Nick Nurse. And now he needs to coach desperate because if you lose and you go down 3-2 after you had a 2-0 lead, now you could be in a lot of trouble. And like we talked about job security, now we might be looking at you and wondering, are you the right guy for this collection of talent that they have in Boston? Yeah. Yeah, you, you don't want to lose a game five. And so, like I said, Toronto has the momentum right now going into game five. Now, I, I, I come a Walker, All-NBA third team a year ago. I know he can turn it up, you know, when when he wants to. I think he will. I still think the series goes seven. Um, but I, I think I think Boston wins game five, Toronto wins game six, and then, you know, from there, game seven, any, anything anything's possible. Um, so I'm I'm actually looking forward. This is one of the better series. Um, my favorite series thus far though has been that uh Clippers Nuggets uh series in which the Nuggets were able to tie it up. They got spanked in game one, which didn't surprise me just because, you know, you, you, it's a whole different ball game going from the Utah Jazz who pretty much the offense is Donovan Mitchell, and that's it, especially since um, Bajanovic, uh didn't didn't play, um, to go up against the, the juggernaut, which is the, the, the Clippers. But uh, they came back in game two. And uh, you know we saw we saw Jamal Murray doing what he was doing in that Utah series. Uh, you know he he boy he crossed up Kawhi. He caught him. He, he caught Kawhi. Hit him with the oop de loop. <laughs> hit him. He caught uh, he caught the M one off of Paul George. Jamal Murray, you know, was was doing what he was supposed to do. And 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 what we spoke about Jokic and what he was going to have to do and what he would be able to do in this series. We saw that in, in game two in a, in a bounce back game for them. And that's that's a big game for the Denver Nuggets to win because if you're Denver, you don't want to go down 0-2 in the series to the Clippers because that could have could have could have been bad and, and, and we would have been looking more than likely would have been looking at a short series because the Clippers, they're not winning on the last second. They when they win them games, they was they they control the game from tip off. To the last minute, and it's a dominating performance from every from everybody on the court. So that will demoralize you. So I was I was happy for the Nuggets that they were able to bounce back in Game Two. Where we go in Game Three, I don't know. 
I think the Nuggets might be able to get game three. I still got this this thing is going. I think it's going going the distance as well. But I I think that um that that the Nuggets can can is still game three. The the length of this series is really going to be determined on how uh, hot Jamal Murray stays. Um, he's one of the streakier guys in the league. So when he's playing um the way he did yesterday, Denver looks like one of the best teams in the NBA because Jokic is getting. There's nobody who's stopping Jokic from getting his numbers. You know, let, we've seen it. It doesn't matter who he plays against. He's getting his. But when Murray is on his game, then they become very tough to stop. They become, again, one of the better teams in the league. And so if he stays hot, yeah, they have a legitimate shot, not only, not only in game three, but for the rest of the series. But if he cools down at any point, then it looks a lot like game one, where they struggle to get offense going and they struggle to do some things. But he make no mistake, he gave the Clippers all they can handle yesterday. Because yeah. as you mentioned – he crossed up Kawhi. He had Pat Bev completely frustrated throughout the game. He, he out, gave he them the out. business. <laughs> yeah, right, because Jamal Murray had him that frustrated. You know what I'm saying? Jamal Murray had those guys frustrated. So if he's on, Denver, as we talked about before, Denver has the legitimate shot to making this a long series. But he's got to stay on. I still like the Clippers. I had them, I believe, winning in, in uh, six games. I, I, I don't remember if I had five or six. But I said it, it really is dependent on how streaky Jamal Murray is during the series. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I agree with, with you on that. Jamal Murray is going to have to continue to play the way he did in the Utah series and the way he played in game two in order for Denver to really have a chance in this series. It cannot be just uh, Jokic. I know he can pretty much do whatever he wants when he wants against this particular team because they don't have, have the size to stop him. But if they're going to make that leap, they're going to need their second best player to, to really step up and do what he's capable of doing. We've seen it, but we got to get that consistency from Jamal Murray. Once we get that consistency out of Jamal Murray, the Denver Nuggets are going to be a very tough team to beat. And, um, and, you know, and they can give anybody in this league problems if both of those two guys are playing at, at the level they were playing at in, uh, in, in game two. Really quick before we transition out of basketball, we didn't we had a, we had a new coach in hire in Brooklyn. We didn't get to talk about this on our uh, recap, <laughs> but uh, Steve Nash is uh is 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 the coach of the Brooklyn Nets. Um, I'm still not completely happy about the the selection, just because and and, and it. It's not to take away anything from Steve Nash because we know what Steve Nash has done as a player, but he has no coaching experience. And if you want to talk about being thrown into the wolves, as good as that Nets team is on, on paper when everyone one is healthy, it's still a situation where you're being thrown into the wolves because you're dealing with two superstars that are – sensitive um and you know they take a lot of things personal personal uh, you know so it, it, it may get tough if they don't come out the gate looking like championship contenders if they struggle starting off the season it could get very tough for steve nash the only plus that i see right just right now just based off the hire is that i know that the nets didn't hire Steve Nash without the okay from Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. So I know, you know, they have that level of respect. I mean, you're talking about a two-time uh, MVP and Steve Nash. So they have respect for Steve Nash. And, I, and I'm hoping that respect will carry over into the season and they can do some great things. But outside of that, the inexperience, you know, and we're talking about, we're not talking about a player who won a championship as a player. You know, these guys got more championships than, than Steve Nash has. Steve Nash hasn't even been to a finals. So that's where I'm like a little bit, I don't know if this was the right pick. I did it, you know, and I felt like they had time. They didn't have to, to hire a coach right now. Um, I know they were talking about Pop, which, I mean, that would have been, in itself, that would have been kind of crazy if they were able to get Pop. But there's other guys out there, Ty Lu. You know, was still was still available. You you know, I'm all for Mark Jackson getting another uh, coaching 
chance in, in this league. And I thought it would have been perfect. He would have been, you know, right back in New York. But they hired Steve Nash. I mean, we got a four-year uh, deal. So we're going to have to just wait and see. But uh, what do you think, Eric? I think it's a terrible hire. Um, and I'm willing to stand on that comment, even if it does work out. If it does work out, you can play this back and be like, hey, you were, you were completely wrong about it. But I don't think it's going to work at all. Uh, these two guys, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, are two of the moodiest superstars the league has ever seen. And they could have all the respect in the world for Steve Nash as a player. That does not mean that that transitions over to his coaching staff. Um, again, no coaching experience. He wasn't a head coach or an assistant coach at any level that at least that I've heard of. I mean, maybe, unless, you know, he was a special advisor to the Golden State Warriors while Kevin Durant was there. So maybe that that's where the connection with Kevin Durant comes in. But being a special advisor and working part-time hours does not equate to the wear and tear that it takes to be a head coach in the NBA. All right. It's a long season. Uh, there's a lot of media requests. There are a lot of issues. You're dealing with 12 to 15 different personalities on your team. And again, when you've got these two guys on the team, that in itself is a full-time job managing their personalities and their mood swings. So now you put him in that situation in New York city, where we know the media is relentless and ruthless. And then you add on the fact that now there are going to be these expectations for the Brooklyn Nets because they finally get KD and Kyrie on the court at the same time. So yep. all those things now for a first-time head coach, for him to try to navigate, I think this thing goes left. Are they a playoff team? Absolutely. I would be lying to you if I didn't think Katie and Kyrie could get to the playoffs together. It would, you and, and I could coach. Them. Yeah, they right. You, them. right. Um, you and I could coach the Nets and get them to the playoffs. I, you know what I'm saying? But – now, when you get in the playoffs, is Steve Nash going to be good enough to get the best out of those guys and be able to advance? Is he going to be an X and, X's and O's guy who's going to be able to know how to exploit matchups? Or is he going to be a guy who's just going to rely on the fact that he has two supremely gifted ball handlers who can get baskets anytime they want? Yeah, you got to listen. You, you, you know, gotta, you not to mention, to there was a little friction. And yeah, you're going to have to coach. And, and let's not forget that there was a little bit of friction in that locker room last year when it was only Kyrie because some of the younger guys felt like, Maybe his leadership isn't the best for us. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So what do you do with Karis LeVert? What do you do with Spencer Dinwiddie? You, these, are, these are really good ball players who are going to wonder, how is Steve Nash going to compliment my game now? Am I just Do I just become a guy who's got to stand in the corner because he only wants to get, yeah. roll the ball out for Katie and Kyrie? I think this thing goes left. I think the Nets rushed it, as you mentioned, because they never sat down with Ty Lue, with Mark Jackson, with Sam Cassell. There's a lot of good coaches out there. You know what I'm saying? Um, let, let's not forget when these playoffs playoffs are done and each round goes by, we're going to see more coaches get fired anyway. So there's yeah. going to be the opportunity. You know, if Houston loses, it, let's say Houston loses in five, is Mike D'Antoni back? He might be available. You know what I'm saying? So there are other coaches that you could have waited on. You didn't have to rush. And I don't think anybody else was looking to hire Steve Nash. So what was the point of rushing to hire him? No one had him on their radar. Yeah, and let me just say this, Eric. Not, you know, I need to. You made a statement. I need to correct you on it. If the two of us was coaching, and that's they win a championship. Let's just make that clear. Oh, right oh yeah, oh yeah. Let's <laughs> not let's not make any mistake about that. But okay, that's what, what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, we don't have neither one of us have NBA coaching experience. Yeah, we exactly. could get them to the playoffs too, right? Like we got 2K experience, yeah, exactly. so we, we could get you there. <laughs> we could get you there. Exactly. We could definitely you know get what you there. But that's, and this is why I also – because for a lot of the things that you said in regards to those younger guys, this is why I think the Nets are going to wind up trading a couple of those guys and to try to bring in a third all-star onto this, onto this team just because of exactly what you were saying about LeVert. And, and, and I love LeVert. I think he's an, he's an amazing talent. Dimwitty, you know dimwitty has been my guy for years. You know that. That and is a fact. That's the, a fact. When he had the porn, the porn stash. Okay, you know that's been my guy. So I would love to see him stay in Brooklyn and, and if they could get to the, to the championship and get a title with the team. But I think that a couple of those guys are going to get moved. It's probably going to be Jared Allen just because DeAndre Jordan was Kevin Durant's guy and Kevin Durant wanted him to start, which I didn't, I didn't like per se just because Jared Allen was developing really well and I think he would have gotten even better, especially – with Durant and, and, and Kyrie Irving there. But I think he's going to probably wind up being traded and maybe one or two of those other guys will, will get traded for, for another uh, all-star caliber player. Um, 
But you know, we'll get again. I, I think it was a, it was a little premature making that decision right now. But I but I gotta I gotta I gotta stick with it. You know what I'm saying? As the, as the Nets fan on the show, and just hope it works out. You know, when you when you have two all world players on the same team, especially in the Eastern Conference, there's a good chance that they'll be able to make it to the NBA Finals just based off of the talent of a healthy Kevin Durant and a healthy Kyrie Irving. And we see how fickle the Eastern Conference is. It might have been a situation had they been there this year where they don't even have to play Giannis in the Milwaukee Bucks because they don't even make it out of the second round. You know, so we're going to have to sit back and uh, and, and kind of take the wait-and-see approach. I hope it works out because at this point, the pick work, the ink's dry. There's nothing that we can we can do about it, so I hope it does. Uh, really quick, we got some NFL news. A couple of, uh, of running backs are on the move. The old, the old man, Adrian Peterson, he's still sticking around. He's, he's going to be running with the Lions this season. Uh, but the bigger signing, in which I want to get your take on and where this puts the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, um, is Leonard Fournette, who will be joining Tom Brady, uh, Gronk fresh out of retirement, Mike Evans, uh, Godwin, and, and the rest of those guys, uh, Kim Brate, O.J. Howard, LaShawn McCoy. The names just keep go, going on and on. Where do you think this signing puts the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this season? Um, I think it's a great collection of, of offensive weapons. I'm interested to see how Fournette gets used uh, because he's going to be used more as a pass catcher than a traditional downhill runner. Um, he'll have his moments, though. But I, I'm still going to take the wait and see approach with Leonard Fournette. But in regards to the team as a whole, um, I really felt they were in a range of 10 and 6. The division they play in is still tough. The NFC is still very good. We got to remember that every every division in the NFC has a, a these two ca- playoff caliber teams, you know, um, the 49ers are probably the best team in the whole conference, but you got the Saints, you got the Packers, you got the Vikings, you got the Cowboys, you got the Eagles, you got um, the Seahawks. So there are a lot of good teams in the NFC. I think Tampa Bay is in that range of 10 and six, possibly 11 and five. I still don't have them ahead of the New Orleans Saints. I think the Saints are just a little bit better, not much, just a little bit better because I like the Saints collection of, of weapons, especially now. Um, that they've an- added Emmanuel Sanders to go with Michael Thomas, to go with Alvin Kamara. Um, I like their collection a little bit better. But ultimately, Tampa Bay is going to be in the mix for a Super Bowl. And Leonard Fournette might be a guy who starts off slow as he kind of figures out the offense. You got to remember, he he just got signed, so he wasn't, in, he wasn't in any of these workouts with Tom Brady before this. But I wouldn't be surprised by week five, week six, he really starts getting it going once he gets that comfort level with Brady and with the offense. Yeah, it, you know, for me, um, and and I, I still kind of want to give the edge to the Saints as far as the division goes, even though I'm still a little bit concerned because now, you know, we've been seeing the past couple of seasons where Drew Brees misses a couple of games, and now they don't have Teddy Bridgewater as the backup. I know, I know they got a uh, uh, Jameis as the backup, but you know, he turns over the ball a, a lot, so I don't put too much onus on him. Um, and, and what you have with, 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 with the, the Buccaneers, we know how much Tom Brady loves passing to the running back. The, the, the chemistry that he had with uh, James White for the past, what, six, seven years has carried me through fantasy football <laughs> many seasons. And last year, Leonard Fournette was fifth in receptions and amongst running backs and fifth in uh, yards amongst running backs. So could you imagine having somebody who can catch the football out of the backfield but can also rush for a thousand yard plus season? Because he never had that from James White. James White was right. not – he's not that every down back that's going to get the yards. He usually had to split it between him and Sonny Michelle, who had a really bad year last year. But – you're talking about someone who can be a dominant running back and can catch and had 55 receptions last season. I'm going to tell you right now for all my fantasy football players, if you're looking for a running back in that, in that second round, you better go with, 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 with Leonard Fournette because him in this, in this offense, especially 
like you said, I, I, it's going to take a couple of weeks, but towards the, 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 the week three, week four, he's going to start to turn up. And he's still going to be – I can still see him rushing for, you know, having a, a good rushing game the first couple of weeks just because, you know, running the ground attack is a little bit different from actually knowing where you need to be to catch those passes. But by come, come week four, I think he's going to start to turn up. And I think this is going to, to be huge for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I, I'll say this. I think the division is going to come down to the last three weeks of the season just because of Tom Brady just has so many offensive we- I, I don't I can't even remember a time when Tom Brady had two all pro wide receivers three I mean we haven't seen Gronk in the year but I don't care that Tom Brady Gronk connection that ain't just go away so you're talking about three really good tight ends you're talking about a, a top running back in football when the hell has Tom Brady ever had anything close to this this many offensive weapons around him so I think it's going to come down to those last three games of the season. And we got to see how those two teams play each other because they are in the same division. So they will be playing each other twice this season. Watch those games because those games are going to count. Because when it, if it comes down to a tiebreaker, <laughs> that's when you're going you're gonna to wish you had won those, those, those division games. Yeah, they actually uh, kick off uh, next Sunday against each other in week one. Um, they, they match up to – start the season but I think with with Tampa the the assortment of weapons is is unquestionable like we know what Mike Evans is um we know even if Gronk isn't a big pass catcher we know he's still an excellent blocker and how he's going to help in that situation and for me the, the right and and red zone ed zone you know matchups figuring out you know again if you put a linebacker on him linebacker is not fast enough if you put a corner or a safety they're not big enough He's going to win that matchup nine times out of ten anyway. But for me, for Tampa Bay, and the reason why I have New Orleans just a head offensive line, um, and that's why I thought they they went out and wanted to get Gronk in because they're going to use him a lot in two tight end sets as an additional blocker. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same thing with Cameron Brake. Cameron Brake really good blocking set well. So that turns them into having six and sometimes seven blockers now for Brady to give him the time to get the ball down the field. Um, but the old line of me is still a question, and Bruce Arians is still a question to me because we can't forget that Bruce Arians has never won anything as a head coach in the league. And so I don't want to compare these two teams because I think Tampa Bay is better. But what we're seeing from Tampa Bay is eerily similar to what we saw from the Cleveland Browns last year. The Cleveland Browns made all the headlines for getting all of this talent, getting Odell Beckham, bringing Kareem Hunt over. You know what I'm saying? Everybody knew about Chubb and and, and – um, Jarvis Landry. And yes, Tom Brady is way better than Baker Mayfield, right? And yes, the, the collection of Tampa's talent is better. But what was Cleveland's it's better, it's better uh, ultimate undoing? Right, right. But what, what ultimately was the undoing of Cleveland was that they had a head coach who couldn't put together a game plan to utilize all those weapons. So, yeah. you know, if we're playing Madden, it's easy to get the ball to Odell and Jarvis yeah, right. Landry. Running numbers. <laughs> right, right. But when you're actually on the field and you got to make adjustments on the fly and figure out what coverage are they giving us and, and this is what we should run offensively, that to me is where we might see issues with them because Tom Brady, make no mistake, has always had a lot of control over the offense. And Bruce Arians is known as an offensive-minded coach. So yeah. one of those guys is going to have to cede to the other one. One of them is going to have to take a back seat and be willing to just say, do it your way. And if they don't come out the gate hot, if they struggle a little bit, if let's say Brady's not really on page with all of his guys because, you know, again, they're not, he's seeing one thing and in the, in the offensive play call is seeing something else. Then we could see some little hiccups and some issues. And that's why I think Leonard Fournette's too, his production in the beginning of the season may not be as strong as we would like, because he's going to try to be, he's got to get comfortable with the play callers as well. In yeah. Jacksonville, he was the whole offense. Yeah, now, so it's a little different now. now he might be the third or fourth best player on the offense. So they got to figure out how to get him involved. The Saints don't have to worry about that. Yeah, Sean Payton, Drew Brees, they got that chemistry. It's a reason why Michael Thomas keeps leading the league in receptions. They got that already. Mm-hmm. Tampa's going to have to figure that out. And it's going to be an interesting first month to see how Brady's adjusting to his new weapons. And also, keep in mind, Tampa loves to throw the ball down the field. So that offensive line has got to be on par to give Brady the time. Because Brady ain't moving out the pocket and, and creating extra time. 
He going to want to plant his feet. <laughs> right. So the O-line has got to be good from the jump to give him the opportunity to get the ball down the field. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think for a team like the Buccaneers who have the – on paper have the potential to be in maybe an all-time great offense this year, they have been affected that by COVID because the fact that we lose the preseason games, which would have been, you know, the time where they could really – get out on the field and work the little kink shot get the timing down. Whereas now you got to use, like you said, the first three weeks are going to have to be used to work the kinks out. It's not like with New Orleans where they already know Michael Thomas knows I need to be here. Albert Kamara knows I need to be here. Drew and everybody knows, you know, where they need to be, when they need to be. So yeah, it is, it's, you know, it is going to be a challenge, um, but I, I'm looking forward to it. You know, hopefully everything they got, the guys can stay safe uh, from COVID. And, um, and and they can make it happen. Uh, really quick shout out to uh, Deshaun Watson. He uh, he is now officially the second highest paid quarterback in football, uh, right after Patrick Mahomes. He got the four year, hundred sixty million dollar extension. Personally, I don't know if I would have took that extension from <laughs> the Texans just because you already traded away a top two, top three wide receiver from me. I had no weapons. I have no offensive line. The defense is is not up to par, so I don't know what he's gonna do. But he got 160 million dollars. Who 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 is not gonna love 160 million dollars in the bank? Right. I I like the move for him. Um. Again, four years. He's back on the market. Um. He'll be. I think he's only 24 now. Yes. Um, so so he he'll strong. he'll be he'll be on the market again before he's actually 30, which is a great thing because he'll get another opportunity to secure the bag. Um. Yeah. But in regards to the situation, we know. Uh, there have been some very questionable personnel moves there. So, yeah. and I wouldn't be surprised if he's playing for a new head coach next year because I don't think uh, Bill O'Brien will be the guy there uh, beyond the season. Know if they make the season because they, yeah, the, the there. division has gotten stronger um, because we know now the Colts actually have a quarterback. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday, the, the Titans picked up Jadavion Clowney to yes. make their defense look even better as well. So it's a much tougher division and not having DeAndre Hopkins and then also having an older David Johnson as your running back is, uh, is, is a recipe for disaster, I think. Who's also injury prone. Right. You got to add that in here. So it's right. definitely going to be tough for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Really quick, uh, we got some tennis news. Just so y'all know, the U.S. Open is going down right now. Wifey for lifey is out there um, doing her thing. She, you know, she beat up on the youngin, uh, uh, Sloan Stevens, to uh, to make it to the fourth round. So you know, I got to shout out Baby Boo anytime I get I get the chance. So we you know we're gonna be getting up um, this week. I don't I want to rock out, you know, tournament, get her, her next Grand Slam title in first because you know you ain't supposed to be doing stuff before the the you know the, the games go down. But uh, shout out to Wifey for Lifey and uh, shout out to uh, Naomi Osaka as well, um, fresh off her boycott of the uh, the the, the uh, what was it? the uh, the the Western and Southern uh, Open, which is also here here in the city, um, after the, uh, the the James Blake shooting, she has also advanced to the uh, to the fourth round, and, and eventually, you know, they might bump into each other again. She got the best of wifey on the last go round, but we coming back for everything they said we couldn't have. So if that happens again, you know, I'm sorry. Love you, kiddo. I appreciate you know what you out there doing, you know, boycotting and all of that. But I still got to. Put my money on wifey for lifey, the, the 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 goat of tennis. Period. I I don't even like putting her just just limiting her to the goat of the women's of women tennis. Serena is a goat. Period in the sport of of tennis. So if you guys are all you tennis fans out there, again the U.S. Open is going down right now. So you can you can catch some of your favorite tennis uh, stars on the on, on the court. Make it happen. Fighting for that uh that Grand Slam. And uh, shout out to Mike Trout. He has officially uh, hit the, the, the 300 home run club, which is also a, a record uh, for, for the Angels. Uh, they they haven't had anyone go beyond that point, so he's now their record holder as well. And, I mean, Mike Trout, is he's another all-time great, and he's going to continue to uh, do better, continue to hit home runs. He's somebody that could mess around and legit, you know, since they don't want to give my man Barry his credit, I give him his credit. They might not want to give us credit. So he's someone that we could see up there in that range. 
uh, when his career is, is is all said and done. Well, I mean, it, you know, uh, and I'm glad you brought up Barry because I was going to make a comment about the media, but we know, and the people who know sports all know that Barry Bonds is the home run king, one of the greatest hitters of all time, um, one of the baddest MFers ever to play the sport of baseball, no matter how you feel about him and no matter how you feel about uh, PEDs, because before the PEDs, he was already a three-time uh, MVP uh, and one of the few guys who could not only hit you 40 home runs, but steal you 40 bases. Uh, and Mike Trout is is built of that same cloth. Mike Trout is that same type of player. It's unfortunate that Mike Trout is on the Angels now when they are in a good team because um, in the early 2000s, you know, they won a World Series. They were always a playoff contender. And so for him to be the best player in that franchise history is saying something because they've had some greats uh, come through that organization. Him being the all-time home run leader and ultimately going to be the best player ever there. But in regards to the media and Trip, like you said, and I agree with you, we got to salute the women doing their thing on the tennis court. But you media outlets, we got to call you out um, because when the young tennis star, as you mentioned, boycotted, she specifically said, I'm boycotting as a black woman in America, seeing what's going on. I feel it's only right that I don't play. But certain media outlets, especially a big one that goes by four letters, conveniently put the, the breaking news out as Asian tennis star, mm. even though she specifically said as a yeah. black woman. As a black woman, she has to right. absolutely right. So, so we got to call y'all out too because as much as y'all love the show support and y'all love to show the clips of protesting and players' comments, you continue to spin a narrative however you see fit. She is also a black woman and she said that and that's how the, that's how the press release should have read, not Asian tennis star. Yeah, and listen, you're absolutely right. While we, while we own the ladies... Um, I would be remiss, and I know we would be remiss. I know you would feel the same, Eric, if we did not say this. We've been saying this every week, and we're going to continue to say this. Uh, and I'm going to give you three names, Jonathan Mattingly, Brett Hankinson, and Miles Cosgrove. And those are the police officers involved in the murder of Breonna Taylor. And those, 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 those men need to be arrested. And we're going to keep saying that until justice has been served for Breonna Taylor, yep. until George Floyd. James Blake now, we got to add him onto the list. Ahmaud Aubrey, the list just goes on and on. But we, we, we need justice, and those police officers need to be arrested. Rest in peace, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Aubrey. And uh, with that being said, Eric, you want to get a quick final thought in before we get up out of here? Absolutely, because I want to keep it on that same topic, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up. Because we're going not only are we going to keep talking about it, we need to continue to hold media outlets accountable. There is photos that have surfaced that shows that the police who broke into Breonna Taylor's home, because let's call it what it is, and murdered her, had body cams on. And before we were led to believe that there was no body cams of the incident, and we were led to believe that they opened fire because Breonna Taylor's boyfriend shot at them first, which he had every right to do because you were unlawfully breaking into their home. Yeah. So we need the media to stay on top of this and re and force the release of that footage because we need to see what took place in that home and we need to hold these police officers accountable for what they did they and let's not forget it and let's not sugarcoat it they broke into a sleeping woman's home in the middle of the night and then when they were met with resistance they opened fire they did they did not address who they were they tried to issue a no-knock warrant for someone who had not lived at that residence for over three years this woman was murdered in her home and her and her uh, they weren't married, but her boyfriend uh, were then made to seem as if, well, he opened fire on the police. Well, what the heck were you expecting when you break in somebody's door in the middle of the night? Yeah, it's not even like you came in the afternoon. No, or, you know, the morning, was, we, we, right. One in the, one they, in the morning, somebody like that would talk one in the morning. They were woken expecting? out their sleep. This was a tax paying citizen who was trying to get some rest for work the next day. Let's call it what it is. Since y'all love the, since y'all love to spin the narrative, y'all love the, y'all love to dig up somebody's dirt when when they get murdered and make it seem like they are the reason they got murdered. She had no reason to be murdered. She was a taxpaying citizen who was in her home getting rest so she can go to work as an EMT the next day. An essential worker. So keep that, put that in your pipe and smoke it. And with that being said, <laughs> I'm Trip Young, my main man, legend in two games, Eric Sanchez. And we will see you guys next week, man. We up out of Peace. here. Peace. Peace.
as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talk of sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh-huh. we ahead of the Yo, streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so we no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought.